Okay, hello, hello? Good. Okay, so on the screen it says uh, session starts soon, which is now. So please grab a seat. Okay, so while you're going to find your seat or change the seat with someone else, um, so far we have talking a lot about uh, space, uh, sending CubeSats or small satellites into space. So we have focused a lot in, uh, in that area. And I think for this session now it's time to get a little bit back to ground and yeah, talk about ground stations ground networks, and uh, these aspects. Um, so this is a yeah, ground station related uh, session, except for the, uh, for the last uh, presentation, which was supposed to be given by Alexandru Sete. Um, I think many of you know the name, but probably mo uh, more of you know G-Predict, which is his uh, software child. And um, yeah, it's very a pity that he cannot be here. Um, but on the positive side, uh, we could use then this spot uh, for uh, another speech, which was supposed to be given yesterday. But luckily, Nico Bucher, he agreed to give it today. So yesterday we could be uh, in time for lunch. And I think this was much appreciated to everyone. Um, okay, so Personally, I've been working here at ESOC uh, since uh, five years now, and uh, I'm doing spacecraft operations, so I'm taking care um, of actually of a constellation of four satellites. And before I started doing operations, I was doing a lot of uh, CubeSat developments, um, and so focusing on the development part. And it's only here, during the operation part of my job, that I realize how important the ground segment is, and how critical it is. Because if before that somebody would ask me, hey, if there's a problem with your communication to the satellite, where would you start searching for the error? I would always assume that something is wrong on the spacecraft. But I've seen here that most of the uh, problems and uh, errors, in fact, are related to the ground segment in some way. Um, like the interfacing to the ground station or some problem with the mission control system. So I was wondering, how comes the satellite is even more reliable or more uh, less error prone than the ground segment? Maybe it's because there's this human factor in the ground segment. That could be one reason. So that's, I think, also the, the reason why we're tending towards more automation to reduce, in fact, the, the human in the loop. But um, still, somebody has to do this automation. And maybe we will hear some about this in the session. So let's have a, a ear on this. Um, I just want to point out that this mission operation aspect should not be neglected. And that's what I see in the CubeSat community. They talk a lot about uh, building CubeSat and how fun it is and the testing of CubeSats. Uh, but yeah, in the end, you're doing this because you want to operate your satellite in space. So let's focus a little bit more on this aspect. And I'm very happy. Um, to uh, to welcome our first speaker, uh, Rafael Mendez. He is giving the talk um, instead of uh, Mario Baldini, who is also here in the audience. And yeah, Rafael, he is um, he is coming all the way from France. Uh, but you might realize that well, he doesn't have this uh, Fr French accent. How comes? It's because he is of Brazil nationality. He comes from Brazil, and um, so ask him how comes that you went to France. And he told me that there's a program in France where they invite foreigners uh, to start a business in France. So maybe uh, this could be also an interesting opportunity for some of you uh, to go there and start a business like uh, Raphael. And um, yeah, so he found he co-founded NanoRaven, which is a company um, 
that he will tell you what it's about. And Nano Raven. So I had to look up this Raven. I, I thought I know what it is, but then it then I just wanted to confirm. So it's this uh, black bird that you see even here outside in the street. And I realized that um, it's uh, it's quite famous to name satellites according to uh, birds. So in the older times, we had a mostly eagle, um, hot bird, uh, falcon. So it now it gets a little bit more cute, I feel. We have these doves, we have uh, ravens, the so the birds become smaller, like the satellites. So if you still want to get a catchy name for your CubeSat, there's this pipsqueak still available. That's this really small, cute bird. OK, um, so he's talking about a uh, ground station. And what I hear a lot in ESOG is this uh, SCOS 2000, so next generation ground segment, the future um, mission control system. But no, Raphael will talk about ground station one. So that's the first one. Let's start from here. Um, and I think this is really good because we would really s we should really think about how we make a clean start and get um, away from the ballast from the past. And his goal is to simplify mission operations, which is not only important for CubeSats but for ESOC also in general. So please welcome Rafael Mendez. <laughs> so here. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to use the p that part of the name for my pitches in the future, for sure. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Ground Station 1. Uh, my name is Rafael. Mario is also here in the audience, uh, so uh, we can talk about that later. So first, about our company, uh, we are based in Montpellier, France, but we are not French, uh, as you can see. Uh, we have a team with experience of around three CubeSat missions uh, in the past. So we learned a bit about the do's and don'ts uh, in CubeSats. Um, our company mainly works with communication solutions for CubeSats, uh, more focused on the reliability of these solutions. And one of our main products is a uh, communication module based on the CCSDS and the ECSCS uh, standards. And uh, because of our background, uh, our company also wants to do a lot of uh, developments in terms of open source projects and so on. Uh, we used a lot of tools in the past, open source tools. So we think it's time to give a bit back uh, to the community. And yeah, that's it. We are incubated in the business incubated incubator center in Montpellier. And we are part, we are part, as, uh, part of the ESABIC uh, network. Okay, so uh, first a bif bi brief introduction about uh, a typical CubeSat ground stations, uh, ground station. So usually uh, a simple implementation of a ground station, you should have an antenna, of course, to communicate with the satellite, uh, some SDR, so uh, you can demodulate the signal and so on. Um, maybe also uh, an inter graphical interface to see the data and to manipulate the data and control the satellite. Uh, also some database to store the, the, the information. And maybe uh, if you uh, want some more complexity, you can upload the data to the cloud uh, and so on. But the problem is that someone has to implement that in, in a CubeSat project. And usually uh, that's where the problem begins. Uh, so according to Ar all, uh, Arthur, I kind of agree with that. Usually the ground segment is the last one that people uh, stop to think about because it's not going to space. So <laughs> who cares, right? So we can do it later. And people from the TTC will say, OK, I cannot do it. I have a lot of stuff to do. I just have to think about link budget and, and stuff like that. The OBC will also uh, try to avoid it. Payload guys will don't want to, to do it. And EPS as well. So uh, in the middle of the mess and all the meetings, someone has to do it. And then sometimes a hero uh, rises, which is the hacker man. And <laughs> And uh, I think that uh, everyone can relate to that because uh, the hacker man usually comes from uh, a subgroup, so he know how he knows how to code, but he's not really an expert in that. So he can do something in PHP, for instance. And um, well, uh, he's going to try to solve the problem. He, he's going to say, "I can do it. Uh, leave it for me." And in the end, we end up with a solution like that. <laughs> so. <laughs> It's a complete mess. Uh, usually there is Windows involved as well. So <laughs> yeah, you know the drill, right? Um, 
so yeah, uh, and I, th I think in my opinion, the problem is that it's a mess, but the worst part is that it works. And it works for only one mission. And if you want to do another mission, you cannot work on the same code. So you have to do it all over again. And it's the same process. You end up losing a lot of time and resources, of course. Uh, then the hacker man uh, leaves the team. Usually that's what happens. There's another hacker, ma hacker man, and it, uh, he's going to do the same thing again and again. So you have like this loop of complexity and bad implementation. And that al actually happens all over the world. So everywhere is like that. There's a lot of groups that uh, are doing the same thing. And uh, me and Mario, we thought, OK, so that maybe uh, doesn't make any sense. Uh, why not? Wh why don't we have uh, like a common implementation of a ground station segment, and so everyone can use it and uh, stop doing that kind of bad implementation and messy implementation. So uh, that's what we want to propose in this project. Um, we are trying to develop uh, basically uh, a system that can be uh, that's open source, so everyone is kind of helping to to develop. So we have all these the, the features that I just talked about. So some SDR, the, the graphical interface, the database, and also some upload to the, cr cr to the cloud. And we also want to add some basic mission operation support because we think sometimes uh, people use, for instance, spreadsheets or something like that. So it's a bit messy. Uh, you have to do, uh, for instance, someone has to go to the ground station and acquire the data during that pass. And sometimes someone misses it, so it starts to get a bit messy. Um, so our project is going to be based on the MIT license. And so ba basically what we are uh, implementing is some sort of layer between the, the ground station operator and the, the hardware systems and all the, like the background of the, the, the ground station. So before the mission, the developers can kind of tune the system to, to insert the data models that they are going to use for that, that mission. For instance, I have my payload, and it's going to be in this field here. I have the voltage of the, the batteries. I have the temperature. So you can tune that in the system. Uh, we have this layer implemented in Node, uh, in JavaScript. Uh, we have some Python and Bash scripts to communicate with the uh, OS and some, some other hardware. Also, we have an interface with uh, GNU Radio, for instance, to, to demodulate and get the data from, from the antenna, and to interface with the ground station hardware, uh, the receiver and the, the rotors in general. So uh, talking about the status of the mission, the mission actually started, the sorry, the mission, the project, the project actu actually started uh, a year ago, more or less, as a spin-off of a master thesis from, of Mario, actually. And it's currently being uh, deployed already in the Centre Spatial Universitaire from Montpellier. We have a good relationship with them there. Also, uh, our past project in Brazil is using it, so uh, uh, it's implemented there as well. So far, we have the dashboard kind of well developed. Also, the cloud deployment, it's uh, uh, also stable. The hardware integration, we still have to add some more other modules uh, to interface with uh, SDR and so on. Um, so like I said, we want to include this operation control features. We still have to implement that. We still have to work more on that and specify better which kind of features we want to add. And uh, finally, uh, we want to do some kind of alerting system. So for instance, if that person who is in charge of acquiring the data during the pass is not aware that uh, he has to do it, there's some alerting system to, to, to let him know that he has to go there and, and get the data. So that's the, the general view of the dashboard so far. Basically, you have some status information about the ground station first and the satellite. Uh, the clocks of the system uh, at the ground station level, and also space. Some information about the latest uh, frame received by, by the satellite. Uh, this one is, for, for instance, for the Robusta 1B mission from CSU in Montpellier. And also some tracking, basic track, tracking information of the satellite. So you have all the, in, in this uh, frame here, you have all the basic information for the operation. You, you've got the general view of the operation. Uh, 
So, and you can also access the past uh, received data. So, for instance, this one is the temperature of the, the battery, I think, over time. So you can check how the mission is developing over time and, and draw some conclusions about that. And our goal is, uh, I think a lot of people here worked with uh, Gino Radio, for instance. It's quite complex to install and to set up the system and, and uh, everything. So we want to do the opposite uh, in a way that you can deploy the whole system in like three commands. We are working on that. So far, it's 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 all right. So we can we can install the front end and in three commands using npm, and also the dependencies. And we we are going to prioritize the deployments in a very easy and simple way. So uh, that's it. Uh, and of course, we are a small company, so we need a lot of help to for that project in particular. So it's on GitHub, and if you if, if you can help be great. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, Rafael. That was a very interesting and funny presentation. So, are there any questions? Here we have. Yeah. And I would like to add that you should really talk to some uh, people outside in Suits because they might want to get this software ah, okay, for right. here for ESOC. All right, all right. <laughs> you, you were showing the, the funny picture with the map that everybody does again and again the same. Uh, I, I have also the same feeling. And do you have some supporting data for that? I don't like formal. I mean, we participated in three projects and we know a lot of people who are working in other projects and they have the same problem. So we don't have a formal data about it, but it's like experience, you know? A lot of groups, they just focus on the space segment because it's the critical part of the system. And in the end, you're just like, okay, we are going to launch in uh, six months. Let's work on the ground segment and let's work fast just to have something. And then <laughs> the hacker man comes into the scene. Yeah. The microphone, please. So I was wondering if we can get some, some data to, to see how... how uh, huge the problem is. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Regarding the data, I think maybe making some survey or something to gather opinions on the topic. Well, anyway, my question uh, was, um, how does it compare with SADNOX? I don't see Pierros over here. Yes, there it is. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I was expecting that. So. Uh, we don't think we are comp competing against Satanogs, for instance. We think we are more complementary. Uh, so, for instance, of course, there is some overlap, but we are more focused on the front end of the, the ground station. So it's like the direct interface with the operator. And uh, for as far as I know, maybe they can help us. Uh, I think Satanogs is more like on the back end and also some parts of the, f of the, the front end too. But I don't know, maybe you can help us with that. Uh, Yes and yes, mm -hmm. actually on both. <laughs> yeah. So we do a lot of automation on passes, multiple scheduling, and all those kind of server-side magic for multiple ground stations around the world for you know track uh, and communicate with um, the different satellites. Uh, but I think that the yeah the, the, this might there is a super solid case for us to collaborate on the UI front end standalone type of you know operation yeah. for a mm -hmm. satellite. Um, the next presentation is actually <laughs> the Satnox one, and uh, Nikos and Freddy will be showing parts of the uh, telemen command and control that we implemented for UPSAT, and you're going to see some parallels in there. But that yeah. part, if that gets connected with the rest of the full automation that we have uh, for the network side of things, I think that that's that that could be really beneficial. Yeah, it would be great because we can have the the whole flow from the front end to the back end, like whole standardized. Great. Another question? Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, when you talk about uh, TTNC, what kind of protocols are you exactly talking about? Uh, so it's configurable. We are not implementing the protocols itself. You can have your Gino radio module, and you can use it as you, as you want. You know? You just have to implement it, and we, we can plug into that uh, to your output and display the data. So that's why I'm saying that we are more focused on the front end. 
So we are not doing the, demo the modulation uh, and so on. Okay, but also to try to avoid the uh, hacker uh, types of protocol level, maybe there would be some, would be nice to have like a, a couple of them which are already supported by default or something like this. Yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. Okay. Another question? Are you um, the, uh, is there any idea to uh, combining with the uh, ground station with the um, validation system or the simulators? To, to the what, sorry? Uh, uh, command validation or the operation validation system? Uh, yeah, the maybe, um, maybe in the, the future. Satellite simulators. Mm -hmm. like uh, we are, we are of course, we are very interested in doing partnerships to do that, and of course. Another question, final question. Okay, good. Then uh, thanks again, Rafael, for the talk. <laughs> so, and the next talk is right on topic, was already announced, so it's going to be about Statnox, and I'm really happy to welcome two open source fanatics, uh, Nikos Rossus and Freddy Damkalis from Greece, from the Libre Space Foundation. Yeah, so um, Satnox, I guess probably everyone here in the room more or less knows about Satnox. Did any one of you already build a Satnox station? Please raise the hand. Oh, yeah, there's. Okay. So, from personal experience, uh, I can say that we also uh, we started building the road tour uh, here in the Cybernetics Club. We had uh, five engineers working on this. Uh, the result is on the table there. And it took us uh, yeah, several weeks to do that. But I was confirmed by Pieros that uh, a bunch of high school students that did this in two days. <laughs> um, so this either says a lot about the kids or about us. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, what I can say is that um, Satnox really boosted this, uh, this the practical realization of, an, uh, um, of a ground segment for CubeSats. And I'm really happy to have them here and to be uh, uh, to be part of the uh, be a co-organizer of this workshop, so please welcome Nikos and Freddy. <laughs> so uh, yes, we'll talk about uh, Satnux. Uh, by now, you all know uh, what Libre Libre Space Foundation is, so I'm going to skip this slide. Uh, so some quick historical bits about the project. Uh, everything started uh, in a local hacker space in Athens, Greece. Uh, a physical space where, as you can imagine, uh, various hackers meet and uh, the local open source community gathers, which includes uh, various, uh, various talents, actually. Uh, uh, radio amateurs, space enthusiasts, uh, developers, Python developers, C developers, or even uh, mechanical engineers. Uh, a really diverse crowd of uh, really smart people, so uh, many projects have uh, spin off out of this uh, place. So about uh, uh, three years ago, we started Sadnox uh, with the idea to build uh, a distributed network of ground stations that would be uh, accessible, cheap, and uh, and really, I mean, an, an open source, of course, and really easy for someone to uh, to get started and crowdsource the whole. Uh, idea of uh, satellite observations. About six months uh, after we started the project, we won the Hackaday Prize, uh, which was a really big boost for us, both in terms of uh, monetary but also in community terms, uh, because it, uh, we gained some publicity in the open source communities and we learned, we earned uh, some open source contributors around the world. So uh, today, we started from Athens, but today the community is really global. And we can see that uh, later in the network part that uh, the community has grown too much that we have uh, spread all over the world. So the goal of Sadnox, uh, I think it's rather simple, and I think in this room I don't have to advocate for the importance of gathering observation data for CubeSats and satellites in general. And But also the, the goal of Sadnox is to automate uh, pretty much everything. Uh, as Arthur said before, we try to uh, kind of remove the human factor out of the whole process and automate 
uh, as many things as possible, uh, either on the on the side of the ground station tracking and or even how we decode data, how we upload data, and how we uh, we verify data. Uh, so moving, uh, we're gonna show some uh, all the sub parts and sub projects that consist of the SATNUX. So let's start to explore the uh, the SATNUX stack. Uh, we're starting from hardware. Uh, we didn't want to exclude uh, people that uh, that had already uh, set up. So uh, for the rotator, uh, you can use any rotator that is supported by Hamlib uh, library, and or if you you can choose to create your own one on your own designs or use uh, our design for rotator. Uh, all the designs are open and free to download. Uh, yeah. uh, about the computational unit, uh, we have a reference platform which is a Raspberry Pi 3 Model B and uh, RTL SDR. However, you can use any SDR that uh, is supported by GR Osmo SDR. Uh, and also you can uh, use any uh, architecture or PC laptops, whatever, that uh, support, uh, that runs Linux with Python and GNU Radio. Uh, also, it's highly recommended to use an LNA for getting better results. Uh, almost all the Sunnox stations have one. Uh, for example, LNA for all. So here we can see several uh, setups. Uh, let me see some. So you can see that some of them have rotators, some are static stops, different antennas. Uh, we have one in Greece, USA, Denmark, Australia. Uh, we are almost all over the world. So uh, you can see here uh, most. Uh, uh, all the stations right now, in network, some on production, some in development stage, getting ready for uh, move to production soon. Yeah, and moving uh, from the local uh, part of things of uh, Sadnex to the to the more cloud uh, side of things. So uh, this consists of two main uh, sub projects, uh, DB and network. So DB uh, was is probably the sub project that it's uh, that expands beyond the reach of Satnux. Uh, when we started the project, we uh, we uh, figured out that there's not a central place uh, for satellite information, metadata, and especially information about frequencies. Uh, there were some parts of this information in blogs and websites of many space enthusiasts. Uh, but there was not one place to gather everything, so we decided to build uh, these websites, db.sadnux.org, uh, which is actually crowdsourced uh, collecting information, so it's something that you can also uh, contribute if you have information for satellites. Uh, right now it has about 200-250 uh, uh, satellites, information about them, and uh, in the process we also decided to use that service to collect uh, decoded telemetry data for satellites. So right now, uh, up until today, we have around 9 million frames for 80 satellites, uh, which the number is uh, constantly increasing. I'm sure that by the end of the presentation, this will be uh, 10 million. And uh, recently, uh, to emphasize that this number is not, uh, this number of frames is not coming all only from SADNOX. It's also coming from other uh, uh, contributors that use different kind of software to uh, to track satellites and decode and push the data back to the DB. Uh, for instance, the recent TK uh, 3WN TLM forward, we kind of uh, merged also with a, a P0 SAT uh, database data, and that really exploded the number of uh, the frames we currently have on DB. And that's a nice example of uh, space community coming together and build uh, something nice. And the second part is the network, which is actually uh, our, uh, the center point where the whole orchestration of the observations happen. Uh, so uh, the network, you can think of it as a, 
a website actually uh, where you can uh, either as a satellite operator you can choose that you want to uh, schedule an observation for your satellite on various ground stations around the world as you saw in the map or the other way around as a ground station operator you can uh, see what satellites uh, what are the next passes of satellites above your ground station and schedule some observations uh, the ground stations collect some data so the data we gather on the network are uh, waterfalls to have a quickly visual uh, representation of the data, the modulated audio, and the modulated data. So these are the, the metadata of, uh, of an observation. So you can see uh, the satellite, the ground station, uh, where you can see also where the ground station is. Uh, the observer, uh, a vetting status of the observation, if it actually has data or not, and various other metadata for the observation itself, like uh, time frame, and etc. That's the the waterfall, the audio, and you can see also the TLE that was used for that specific observation, and the modulated data. And to complete the cycle, let's go back to the local side of things. Okay, uh, back to the client side of the network. So uh, the the process is you start the client. Uh, client checks periodically for new observations from network, new scheduled observations. Uh, it got the list of the scheduled or of the scheduled jobs, and then when time comes for the observation, uh, start sending commands to rotator. Then uh, starts the GNU radio scripts the, that is collecting all the data from the satellite. Uh, adjust the frequency in order to uh, solve the Doppler uh, effect issues, uh, and during the uh, during the observation generates uh, data for drawing the waterfall, uh, an audio file, and any other demodulated data. Uh, at the end of the observation, it's it uploads all the data to the network to be able to, see, to be seen from any uh, from <coughs> sorry from everyone uh, you can install the client uh, through the source uh, python package or you can use the uh, recent uh, raspberry pi image uh, which includes everything and you just set up uh, some variables and it's ready uh, also, uh, client includes a web interface that allows you to run your station in a standalone mode for receiving or transmitting. For example, here you can see uh, oops and command and control uh, based on ES, uh, ECSS uh, standards. Uh, and it's easily adaptable to support other satellites too. Yeah, and if it's not obvious already, everything is open source, in both in software and hardware. Uh, so in many parts of the project, it's really easy to, to contribute, depending on your talent. So, uh, well, the obvious one is to set up a station. So we have a documentation on the wiki on how to get started uh, with various different steps. Uh, you can contribute to DB, I mentioned before. So you can contribute with data, information. Uh, if you are a developer, we, the stack is uh, rather big. We have Python, C, C++, JavaScript. Uh, you can help uh, with documentation uh, or even with testing and automation, which is always needed in these kind of things. Uh, so that's it, and we have to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we have a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah so um, I have two questions. Uh, first one is with that, uh, the SDR, do you only have uh, downlink, right? Not uplink. No, we can support both uh, downlink and uplink, well, depending on force of the SDR you, you are using. There are SDRs that. But with the one that you showed in the recommended The, the RTL SDR? Yeah. Yeah, this this one no, only doesn't only support TX no. Yeah. But we have other setups like the one in 
uh, ingress in the hacker space, which is able to transmit data. Okay, and um, which ones? Uh, which fre frequency bands do you do you uh, use or that, that, that do you support? We, we as we use SDRs, we can support uh, pretty much everything. I mean yeah, sure. Yeah, d depending on the hardware, on the antenna, but and that the hardware is, is it open source or I mean, you release the the antenna open source and then that that supports uh, I, I guess a frequency band or not or that's not so part of the sat net mm -hmm. or the sat nox so sorry i didn't get you I mean my, my question is do you you propose an, a design and you have an open source design for a, mm -hmm. a around the station and does it include the the rf the antenna design or only the yeah, yeah we have also antenna designs and we also produce uh, more antennas to test setups and okay, yep. uh, my question goes in a similar direction do you um, do you provide uh, tech services for uh, the satellite operators and uh, if so uh, are they available over the network and um, if yes then how uh, is the uh, license for the operator of the stations managed how do you solve that yeah. Yeah. Just, just for the legal aspect uh, of it. Um, so basically, right now you are able to to get access in a standalone mode Satnox client. So Satnox client comes in two modes, like the network mode, which just put it there, you leave it, it does the observations, it uploads it back to the network, you don't care about it, right? And then there is a standalone mode for the Satnox client, which basically you can command it, uh, com yourself and do get uh, the UI to to command the satellite that you want, right? given that you have support for your satellite, obviously, but let's say that you have. Now, in this case, well, if it's a local station, then you're fine, like legally, you should have sorted out the license and everything else. And if, if it's a remote one, then it goes in a one-on-one -on -one communication. And in some countries, that's actually legal, in some others, uh, it's not. So it depends on the country, it depends on the situation. But it's totally possible engineering-wise and code-wise as it is right now, if that's your question. So, so do you on the server provide any uh, services for uh, commanding satellites? You mean paid services? Ah, uh, no, no yes, we would be open to to yeah. Like, if you have a satellite mission and you want to command it, come to us and we can figure out the the way to to, to do that. Yes. Other questions? Yeah, maybe one. Um, you showed the metadata of the, the satellite uh, data somehow. Um, is it a standard, standard format, or uh, oh. you uh, by itself, by nature? Maybe. You mean the observation metadata? Yeah, we are showed? you using an external standard, or are you just? Uh, uh, no, we're not using a standard, but we we expose them to a public API, so it's really easy for someone to to build on top of that. And and craft the data. Thanks. Okay, so uh, before uh, some of you mentioned that you were building Satnox station, so this is your chance now to give some feedback, positive as well as uh, critics, if you have some to share. Okay. Okay, just, just to give uh, some of information, you're talking about SDRs, you're using GNU radio, and uh, someone asking about transmission. Because normally, as far as I know, SDRs are not able to transmit on uh, frequencies above VHF. It's, ve it's very, very complicated. You normally use other, other kinds of uh, transmitters, and uh, they have to have at least a CAT uh, command interface just uh, to uh, switch on frequencies and any other else. So really practical example, USRP B100 mini with a power amplifier or uh, kind of a narrow band like on 1.2 gigs. Like the, the USRP actually does all the way up to six gigs, but you don't need that obviously. So 1.2 gigs, 
like have the narrow band amplifier, have the RF switch on top of it, commanded by the GPIO uh, inside the, um, there's a GPIO port on the USRP any case, or use uh, either one of the antennas, it's a one by one antenna on top of the USRP, and it works right now, like as it is. So there are multiple different SDRs that actually can transmit all the way up to 2.4, like really reliably without the need of specialized equipment for, you know, kind of like upper, higher, higher upper up, uh, type of things. And for higher upper bands, you would already, you know, do block up converters and, you know, down converters to bring the frequency down uh, to, to something that is much more manageable for your, you know, rest of equipment. But up, up, up to 2.4, you should be fine with pretty much everything, even five in most cases. Um, yeah. Any question? Following up on this question, um, you mentioned USRP, which is uh, what cost thousand more than thousand euros. So I was always interested in uh, SDRs that are low cost. I mean, you mentioned the RTL dangle as well, which costs ten euro, but it's only for reception. So for sending, uh, you have to pay a little bit more. Do you have experience with this HackRF, which is like three hundred euro, and then also this Lime SDR, which is new? is more powerful, also 300 euro. Mm -hmm. You have yeah, in the audience, perfect. I, 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 will, I, will, okay, I will include it in, in, in my elevator pitch, so we can... No, no. <laughs> it's yeah, we, 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 we made uh, 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 really, HackRev was one of our first experiences. Mm -hmm. No, FunCube was our first experience of SDR radio. And then we wanted, we wanted to have uh, bigger bandwidth is, and then we said, oh, cool, HackerRef, that's nice. You can go to six gigabytes, wow, uh, gigahertz, that's cool. And yes, it works if you have really good antennas, but in that, in that, in that case, it's really right that the best, uh, uh, that the best amplifier is a good antenna. But if you have only, uh, let's say, medium antennas, HackerRef is nothing for you. you. You will see the signal for sure in the, in the waterfall of your software-defined radio front end, but not exp n never expect to, to get uh, the signal decoded. And they say it also, it's a laboratory device for performing experiments on the table. Okay. Any more comments on this? Lime SDR? Okay, then maybe other question. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I'm on the database uh, satnox.org uh, site, and uh, I like to understand what is the plan with the database uh, in your mind, because I see that for many, many projects, there are, there are only few, very few transmitters. So what does it mean? Uh, the CubeSat team uh, would take the packets back or would put them on the database? Uh, w what is the interest behind that? Well, uh, ideally, f especially for new CubeSats and new missions, yeah, I mean, the, the CubeSat, uh, the satellite operators know which frequencies the CubeSat has, so ideally they can uh, just sign up and suggest uh, the transmitters for the CubeSat. So, as I said, it's a, it's a crowdsourced effort, so the submission is open. It's not handled just by us, we just moderate the website. So, ideally, all the new CubeSat should, be, should have accurate data there for transmitters and frequencies. Yes, because uh, the DB also, well, first of all, has a public API, so you, you can consume this data. Uh, well, if I understand the question right, is uh, if, the cube, if the satellite operator has any interest in putting this data on DB. Yes, and also through the API, uh, network fetches the data and uses the ground station use that data to schedule observations. So if the data on DB is not accurate, you cannot schedule observations easily on the network side. So if the satellite operator wants to utilize the Sadnox network, the first step is to uh, populate the data on DB. Okay, uh, last question from Christian. Uh, hello, I'm Chris, just a quick one. Do you ha also have had a look on Red Pitaya SDR because that's a quite well documented and maintained SDR project from pa Pavel Demin, I think he's called. So have you heard about it already? So Red Pitaya is mm. also a FPGA-based um, SDR platform. I think it's around two or 300 euros, but it's yeah, I, I think you can receive on two channels and also transmit on one or two channels at the same time. 
Yeah, I don't think we have tested it yet, right? Yeah. Let's but make yeah. a work group on this. <laughs> SDRs. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. We are running uh, uh, out of time a little bit. So <laughs> let's continue. Okay, so now is a little bit of a cut because, um, well, we have uh, now a presentation about a flying laptop. Well, um, and so, well, so it's also ground related because uh, Nico Bucher, he was also working, uh, he was doing the um, onboard software as well as the, as well as the uh, ground software. And in particular, he did testing. He's from Stuttgart and he's doing his uh, PhD in software testing and verification. And yeah, for me, uh, software testing is a little bit like popcorn. In the beginning, it's, uh, it's like a little bit dry. But once you get hooked to it, then you can't stop. Um, and yeah, flying laptop. So it's, uh, it's uh, by definition, it's not a CubeSat. Uh, but yeah, we're in the open source community. We take what we, ca what we get. Um, but no, the, the thing is that um, it's an open source CubeSat workshop, but it's not limited to CubeSats. In fact, we, we want to use CubeSats as a, uh, because they're very, um, uh, they're, they're very good for testing out new things. And, uh, but eventually our vision is that openness and open source will be applied to all kind of space activities. So in that sense, Nico is already a step ahead. And yeah, let's uh, welcome him and come to the stage, please. Thank you, Arthur. Hello. So my name is Nico Bucher and I'm uh, responsible for software testing in the Flying Laptop project, as Arthur said. But I'm not only responsible for software testing, I was in the project uh, for five years now and um, my first task was, was software testing. But then uh, we needed a guy who does for system testing, we assembled a satellite and nobody was there to test it. So I did that job because the guys th thought, yeah, he's doing software testing, so he must know something about testing. So I got the system testing job as well. And then when the system was fully tested, um, there was no ground segment. <laughs> so we needed a guy to, to do the ground segment. And I didn't say no quickly enough, or I don't know why. <laughs> Maybe because I had scores installed already. So I was the guy who also built the ground data infrastructure. Okay, and I also don't think that this uh, talk will be um, wrong for this session because it will also be a lot about um, ground software, not only the onboard software of the Flying Laptop. Um, this is Flying Laptop. As you can see, it is not a CubeSat. Um, well, it's not a laptop either. <laughs> so, um, but it is a satellite and it can run software. So let's agree about that. My talk will be uh, structured like this. I will first uh, talk about the mission, what we achieved so far, and uh, how it went until now. Then I will um, tell you about the software that we are using in Stuttgart, on the satellite and on ground. And then um, I'm going to uh, say a few words about the open source aspects, because we want to now release some of the software that we have developed in Stuttgart and get involved more in the open source community. And then I'm going to give uh, an outlook what's to be done next. So as I already said, it's not a CubeSat. Here in this picture, you have to trust me, this is flying laptop. And this is, well, a bigger satellite, even bigger satellite. But regarding software, I don't think that the dimensions of the satellite really matter so much. I, the average software doesn't care if it's running on a CubeSat chip or on such a big thing. Um, and also the next uh, satellite from Stuttgart will definitely be smaller. We have to save on launch costs. And uh, maybe it will be a CubeSat. Um, and because it is planned to reuse a lot of the software that we have in Stuttgart, um, this is also relevant for a CubeSat workshop, I think. So um, we launched on July 14th. 2007, so we are now five months uh, almost in orbit. Um, it was a cluster launch on a Soyuz from Baikonur. This is flying laptop. We are the second largest payload on the upper stage. The 
main payload is Canopus YIK. It's a Russian Earth observation satellite. And you can also see that there are a lot of um, payload deployment containers on the launch, so there were a lot of other CubeSat missions in Baikonur. It was re really nice to meet all of them. Um, on day two, we uh, deployed the solar panels, and uh, after four days, we finished the launch and early orbit phase. And the mission goals of Flying Laptop are, first of all, education, because we are a university, and then uh, multispectral Earth observation. We have a few cameras on board, and uh, technology demonstration. The status so far, um, we do not only use our own antenna station in Stuttgart. For um, especially during LEOP, we uh, used DLR ground station network. Uh, we used Weilheim as a backup station and uh, had over 60 satellite passes together. We also used O'Higgins in Canada and Inuvik in, in Antarctica. So the ground segment had to be able to switch between antenna stations flexibly. Um, the system is stable since launch. Uh, we didn't have a non-board computer reboot yet. Uh, the attitude control system is operational. Um, the temperatures are below uh, between 10 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius, and communication was almost always fully reliable. We use S band uh, uh, and CCSTS protocol, uh, CCSTS coding. Here are a few example pictures we already took. There are lots more, but this is just. Uh, few examples and also a picture uh, of our control room. So now I'm going to uh, show you a little bit the landscape of what kind of software we are using on ground. Um, first of all, in the mission control room, we are using SCOS uh, version 3. It's a little bit old, but uh, the project is old as well. Um, for orbit propagation and path planning, we use a software called Astos which is from a company in Stuttgart. So it's a commercial product. Um, then we use Moise or Morris. I don't know exactly how it's pronounced, scheduler. I think uh, at ESOC, Moise is known um, for mission planning. And then we use a lot of custom tools, web-based tools for telemetry visualization. Um, and also a lot of Python scripts for of automation and mission planning. Then the heart of the, of the ground data segment is the Java application, which can flexibly uh, move packets and frames uh, from antenna stations to SCOS or other things for the data. Um, and then we use another Java application to move the antenna and control the antenna. Um, then there's the software development laboratory where we run uh, on a, a satellite simulator, a model-based satellite simulator with an onboard computer engineering model in the loop. Um, this we use for ex uh, to test the flight software and the flight software framework. And uh, also we use MOIS for uh, test procedure execution. And the uh, software highlighted in blue, I'm uh, going to show a few, s few slides later because these are the ones that we want to open source now. Um, one of them we already have, but the other ones are coming. So first of all, the flights of the framework um, is the onboard software of the Flying Laptop. And we decided, because we could not release just the onboard software of the Flying Laptop with all the mission-specific code, we decided to split it into a framework and to mission-specific user code. Um, the framework itself is modeled as a hierarchical tree of components. You can model objects in the software that represent components, for example, or subsystems in the satellite. Um, and then a tree like this uh, is formed. And uh, it is programmed object-oriented, written in C++, and uses RTEMS as a real-time operating system. But it's also POSIX compliant, so you can exchange RTEMS with basically any POSIX operating system. Um, we use ECSS PUSH standard and are compliant to that. Um, and it will soon be released uh, with working user code example under the Apache license. Um, as I already said, we have this Java application in the ground segment, um, which can flexibly route space packets 
transfer frames, whatever you want between antenna uh, equipment and mission control. You can also use uh, other tools, web-based tools to live monitor these connections. And um, yeah, we have had really good um, experience with that because it basically runs, just runs and shovels data from A to B. And uh, such, uh, such a B is a TM archive, which then stores telemetry data in a MySQL database um, for later retrieval. And we offer a REST API to, to um, access the data, and then we have web-based tools to, um, to display. I think uh, something similar was in the, in the former talk. And then there's uh, another project. It's a small program. Um, it just started out as a, as a programming exercise. I wanted to um, do something similar, like discuss packet history but more with the focus on uh, onboard objects. So with this software, you can see all the packets that are coming in, but if packets are events, then the, these events are attributed to the onboard object. So if an error is in a device, then something pops up and says, oh, there's an error and alarms the, the operator. Um, and this is already available on GitHub. Of course, it works best when if you're using the flight software framework, but it can easily be adapted to work with other missions. Okay, for me, the benefits of open source software are um, if you are in university and you cannot afford expensive commercial software, it drastically reduces costs if you are working with open source software. Then, of course, it increases compatibility between systems and organizations. And um, also very important, it prevents everybody from building everything over and over again. And that's, th I think, the most important point. Um, and as a university, open access to software and data is always an important thing. So for a university, it is not desirable to um, build a project about upon a commercial software. But uh, as a downer, it not every commercial software, there's an open source alternative right now available, or one that's suitable. So we are currently looking for open source alternatives for the spacecraft simulator framework that we are using. We are not using an open source one right now. Um, the test execution framework and the orbit prediction software. So that's it. Um, we are planning to further automate the mission in the future. We will have unattended passes and also mission planning should be more automated. And we plan to release an open source software defined radio receiver for all payload data so that uh, radio amateurs can pro benefit also from our uh, payload data. And we want to get more involved in the open source software community. That's what we are doing now. So I'm looking forward to your questions and thank you. Thank you, Aniko. Yeah. I'm really amazed to see uh, all the software that you're actually using in Stuttgart. Uh, it's almost the same that we use here, so we might consider Stuttgart as a backup uh, for ESOC. I must say, when I had to <laughs> when I built when I had to build the ground segment, I was looking to ESOC what they are doing. So, <laughs> because uh, as a university, you want to teach students how to how to work in industry, and uh, I think you cannot do anything else than just apply what they are doing, so they're best prepared. Mm. We have a question. Um, thanks. That was an excellent presentation. Um, going back to your last slide, you uh, you'd identified right several things for open source alternatives. Um, I was wondering if you if you had plans to work on any of those in the future. Well, I think we had already a few uh, presentations today or yesterday where already alternatives were presented, and I don't think that we ourselves will get involved so heavily into this. Um, it's also, I think, good if, if there are not thousands of possible uh, alternatives, but one that everybody is using. So, for example, a third eye could be a replacement for the simulation framework and also uh, Helge's software for the um, orbit prediction. Looks promising. Yeah. Uh, Hi. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Uh, this is a TM inspector tool. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you load the, the, the telemetry definitions from? From, uh, uh, we have SCOS 2000, so we basically have a MIP. 
mission okay. information base. Um, but we have it also in another format. We have it for SCOS in the traditional format, mm -hmm. these dot files you maybe know. And then we have a MySQL database where also the MIP data is stored. And uh, this um, telemetry inspector can access this database and gets this information. But it, from it is basically the MIB but represented as the mm -hmm. MySQL tables. Yes. So if uh, if we were to take uh, a MIB from another is a mission, we could potentially give it to this open source tool. Yes. And the to for the TM inspector, I'd say it's it's a side project of me. It's a hobby project. It's not so compatible or not so flexibly programmed that it can be that it can work out of the box with any mission. <laughs> there is some uh, work you have to to put into it to to adopt it to another mission, but it's uh, it's not not very complicated. Okay, I mean, if you um, if you're interested, you know uh, about Topsat. Uh, yes. It's a it's a CubeSat uh, that is going to be used by experimenters. So anyone can just uh, subscribe and say, "I would like to run my software on your on this is a satellite," and they get a couple of days. Uh -huh. And then it would be interesting to see uh, sure. if this could could be used. Of course. Um, yeah. Thanks for a really interesting presentation. I have a somewhat different question. I think okay. um, not technical in nature, but. Since uh, you know you're at a university and you talked about certain parts of uh, the framework that you've uh, open sourced, um, having experience of that dialogue within a university as well in my group about open source and convincing professors or other people about what open source is, why you should do it, I was wondering if you could comment on that aspect of it uh, in Stuttgart, was it easy to convince other people this is a good idea or did you see barriers that people don't understand open source and education and you really had to convince them? I think that's an excellent point um, because especially at the university um, you have different people contributing and they are not always even employed by the university. So you have students for example that are writing software as part of their master thesis and I'm not a law expert, but I think they have the uh, in intellectual property of that software. So, so you have to have some form of agreement with the students that you are supervising in how to proceed if they are finished with the software that they, uh, that they leave behind. Um, and you want also to use it in your, in your ground segment. So yeah, I think there are a lot of legal aspects uh, at first. And then, yeah, not everybody is fan of open source and then there's also already al always a controversy if, um, for example, a programmer is not so confident in their code and they don't, they don't want to get it exposed to public and uh, you have all kinds of these problems. Yeah. And uh, I think the more mixed a team gets and the more different backgrounds there are, the more difficult it gets to, to have this open source spirit. If I have tips to convince people, I don't know. <laughs> Bring them on a conference like this, maybe. <laughs> <or> <laughs> yeah. Okay, another question. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add a little bit because I was uh, involved in that project before and uh, I left the project around, uh, I think, 2013, 2012, and I was pushing for, it for, the, for the release of the, of the onboard software as open source already at that time. So uh, I it's a long-term project, so to say. To, to, convince, to convince yeah, yes, to convince a long fight yes to convince the university everybody. to to let go yeah. but i think it's worthwhile and that's also part um, of the reason why it is not released yet uh, we still have to finish everything up and 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 get uh, the law side of it uh, correct okay thanks very much uh, we end here because it's uh, thank you nico <laughs>
starting will be at the end of the next session. And if you want to know how a pitch works, uh, approach Red, he will inform you. And now please grab a coffee and relax.